Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Want to welcome everyone who's joining us for today's live webcast. Our special guest for today, the Reverend Dwight Welch uh, from Montana, will be joining us probably at about 1240 our time, so about five or six minutes. He texted just a little bit ago, let me know he's running a few minutes late, but he will be here shortly. So in the meantime, I wanted to talk about a few other things. Of course, this is the live weekly webcast of the Objector Church. And so if you're not familiar with us, you can go on our website at objector.church. Easy to remember, objector.church. And we are a community that's devoted to the principles of religious humanism and peace. And so we obviously in this moment in time, this moment in history, what we're about is critically important in times of religious division, political division. There's a lot of forget, a lot of folks are forgetting our common, our common connection as a part of common humanity. And so that's what we're about, is trying to remind folks of those connections. And that's why, again, I've chosen the coexist banner in our background here. And it's just a reminder of what it is that we're about. So, one to though, for everyone joining us, we are on two platforms. We are live on Zoom, and that's really the best way to interact with us. If you want to follow us there, you can go to objector.church slash meetup, and there's the information there, how you can log in via the Zoom uh, platform, which can either be done through a computer, through a cell phone, and also through telephone. But we also stream live to Facebook Live. Now, the Facebook Live, from what I can tell, is a second or two behind, um, but I am monitoring this one. So this week, to try to avoid some of our bandwidth issues from last week, what I'm doing, I'm running two computers. So if you're wondering why I have two computers here, one of them is running the Zoom platform. And so if you interact with me on Zoom, I can respond there. But meanwhile, I'm also running Facebook Live over here so I can be able to interact with folks because that's a part of what this is about each week. In fact, there are three parts of all of our live weekly webcasts are inspiration, information, and interaction. Inspiration being things that lift us up, that help us to get by, to move on in working for peace and justice. Information is about the practical ways we can work for peace and justice in our lives, in our communities, and in the world. And finally is interaction, and that's where we're wanting to provide places and ways for folks to connect with each other. And for this to be not just a one-way conversation, but to be a true two-way interactive experience. So, when, uh, again, welcome everyone who is joining us, and we're going to check real quick to see if Dwight is on. He'll be here hopefully momentarily. In the meantime, I want to mention that you're welcome to leave us comments, um, questions, and whatnot. We'll have some special time at the end to, to respond to those. But we also, along the way, we may be able to respond to them as well. And so you can post them either on the Zoom platform or on Facebook Live, and we'll be sure and read those over the air. Only thing we ask is to be, be nice, you know, basic kindness, that kind of thing. So. Well, a few bit of announcements I want to mention. First of all, for many people are aware that this is Giving Tuesday, a, uh, an anti-consumerist response to the Black Friday madness. And so if you have money that you would like to give to a good cause, I have one to recommend to you, and that is the Objector Church. You can find out more about how to give to us at objector.church. One of the things specifically we're raising money for is for staff time to enable us to keep doing these weekly webcasts, to enable our other staffers, uh, Jeff and Anya and Oakland, to keep doing their work with Courage to Resist, to organize, to build up um, um, infrastructure and capability to support war resistors, whistleblowers, and conscience objectors. So there's a lot we'd like to do. So if you'd like to find out more how you can give, go to our website. Also, if you'd like to join our church and to be more integrally connected to it, there's information on that as well. While I'm thinking about that, I want to show off these really nifty little stickers. And I, you can't really see them well on camera, but we have these stickers. And so if you are interested in getting one of these, um, send us a donation and ask for a sticker and we can send one out to you. Um, but I love them because they, they look good on um, car bumper, looks good on the bicycle, looks good on your laptop computer. They're really nice, beautiful, full color stickers. So anyway, would love to send one, one of these out to you. So again, send us a donation and we can do that. Also, a few more things while uh, for, for Dwight joins. Just want to mention that um, 
uh, yesterday, actually, let's see, no, the day before yesterday and Sunday, we had our very first local event here in Oklahoma City for the Objector Church. We had an alternative Thanksgiving gathering, a time for people who have concerns with the traditional ideas of Thanksgiving to still get together, to have an excuse for some feasting, some fellowship, some conversation. We had this event at Nappy Ritz Bookstore, which is an incredible bookstore. It is the only Black-owned bookstore that we're aware of in Oklahoma. It's located at Northeast 37th and Kelly. There's a shopping center there. Right there at that corner is the bookstore. It's a fantastic bookstore. I was, I'd never been there before. I should have a long time ago, but there's an incredible assortment of books. Certainly a lot of books from an African-American cultural perspective, but also a lot of other books on all kinds of topics. It's just, it's, it's a, I love independent bookstores, but this one might be my new favorite. But they also do things like after-school tutoring. They have events. It's just a really neat place. So we're really blessed and honored to get to have the event there. And want to especially thank Camille and Van Bosch for making it possible for us to have the event there. We had basically a potluck style meal and we had a fundraiser for our friend Bob Waldrop we talked about last week who is dealing with cancer. By the way, Bob is doing fantastic. He made it through his big round of surgery. He's doing really well. Hopefully he'll be back to his usual self soon. But in the meantime though, he is having missed a lot of work and so that's why we're raising some money for him. By the way, I'll mention if you want to give uh, just to help Bob, that's still available. You can go to the website for actually, no, go to our Facebook page for the Oklahoma Objector Church and you can find out more there or just shoot me an email at james at, at uh, objector.church and I can give you more information on that. But we're still going to be collecting some donations the next month or two for Bob. So with that said, what I'd like to do now and hopefully, let's see if... Uh, Let's see if, if Dwight is on yet. So I have not, so while we're waiting for him, what I'm gonna do is last week we did something kind of new. As a community, we are religious humanists, meaning that we, we deal with the issues of ultimate questions, ultimate importance, but we are also approaching it from a universal standpoint where that we are open to the teachings and ideas of religious traditions, but we're not, exclusively wedded to them and we're also open to non-religious traditions as well and so i've been as a way of kind of taking some of the rituals and things that are meaningful in the religious world one of them is the idea of ritual and so i've been using last week and we'll use it some more this book called and it's hard to see it on camera okay there it is the book of blessings um, new Jewish Prayers for Daily Life, the Sabbath, and the New Moon Festival by Marcia Falk. And this book is written from a non-theistic Jewish perspective. And so I'm going to read this, um, this uh, blessing that she has. I'm changing one word to make it a little more universalist, uh, but other than that, it fits very perfectly. And what I will do is, I'll, there's one little bit I'll read in Hebrew, the rest of it will be in English. I'm seeing this, my suggestion is, is that uh, if you're religious, great, but if you're not, this may be just a good setting intention, a reminder of our common connecting point in this world and as human beings. Shema Kavara la Elohot alafe panim, melo olam shakineta ribure paneha ekad. Hear, O congregation, the divine abounds everywhere and dwells in everything. The many are one. Loving life and its mysterious source with all of my heart and all my spirit and all my senses and strength. I take upon myself and into myself these promises to care for the earth and those who live upon it, to pursue justice and peace, to love kindness and compassion. I will teach this to our children throughout the passage of the day as I dwell in my home, as I go on my journey from the time I arise until I fall asleep. And may my actions be faithful to my words that our children's children may live to know truth and kindness have embraced, peace and justice have kissed and are one. So that was our Shema, a little bit of a setting intention for our time together. So now I'm gonna check and see again if Dwight is on, let's see here. Okay, 
Well, while we're waiting for Dwight to come on, and again, I know he had a, a complication of schedule happen the last minute. I want to talk about, this is going to, well, I'm just going to talk about a current issue and a bit of response here from the Objector Church. Um, as many of you hopefully know, um, this last weekend on the border was pretty rough. We knew that things were looking bad. We knew from the statements of President Trump of encouraging the use of lethal force in violation of U.S. and international law. We knew that there was a danger, but in this case, it actually happened. Thankfully, using so-called less than lethal weapons, but still the use of tear gas being shot across international borders, um, and in many cases, targeting women and children. A dreadful, dreadful situation. And we as a community at the Objector Church, we're deeply concerned about this because one, we oppose war and violence of all kinds. We also oppose oppression. We also oppose these times and situations where, where there's degradation, where there's dehumanization. And so, I uh, wanted to mention that we're in the process now of working with our friends at the Military Law Task Force on drafting up a, 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 a legal memorandum basically explaining the rights and responsibilities of deployed U.S. service members who might be being sent to the border. And so since we have a few minutes here, I want to talk a little bit about that. Basically what we're, the, 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 the document we're preparing is discussing is the fact that you at any service member of any branch military in any country, international law makes it clear that obeying orders is not an excuse for war crimes. And so there's always the question of when in the military context, if someone is given an order, is it a valid order? Is it a legal order? If it is an unlawful order, under the law, there is, very, there is a very clear provision that allows for a service member to disobey the order and to not be punished for it. The problem here, and we discuss this in this, this memorandum, discusses in detail, is that the, the risk is all on the service member, meaning that if the service member decides that a law is unlawful, it violates US law, it violates the Constitution, it violates other milita uh, higher up military regulations, or presumably international laws incorporated through the US Constitution, the problem is, is that the judgment is made by the service member. The problem is that the, that the military and their regulations have stated that there's a presumption that orders are lawful, which to me is a really troubling, troubling concept because it basically means that if orders are lawful or presumed to be lawful, then if a service member acts in contravention and against the regulation, if a service member acts in a way that violates the regulation, then it's up to a military judge to decide, yes, was the order lawful or not. And so one of the things we're encouraging folks to do who are in this position of trying to decide, are my law orders lawful or not lawful, is one to talk to a lawyer. The Military Law Task Force is available and ready to help folks in this situation. Um, and I work with Military Law Task Force. I'm on the steering committee there. I've been involved for quite a few years now, and we've, we stand ready for any of these situations. There's quite a few lawyers, including myself, who are willing to give, give free consultations to talk with soldiers about their rights, to talk with them about understanding what, what the implications are, what happens if they follow an unlawful order, what happens if they resist an unlawful order. We encourage folks to to reach out. Also want to let folks know that in the case of where you're needing ongoing legal support, there are organizations ready to step up to help raise funds as needed. Courage to Resist, which is an organization that is fiscally sponsored by the Objector Church, has been doing this for a long time. But also About Face, Veterans Against the War, Veterans for Peace, and other groups we know are ready to take up this, this cause as well. So if you're out there, if you're struggling with these issues, we encourage you to get in touch. Now, for those of you who are not in the service, but you are peace activists, you're concerned about this issue, we will have this up very, very soon. And as soon as it is, we will have it posted on the Objector Church website, at Courage to Resist, the MLTF website, and a lot of different places. One of the things we're working on, too, is some kind of small business card size. Uh, thing that, that folks can hand out to service members, particularly for those in the border regions. And so we'll have those ready very, very soon. We're in the final round of editing as we speak. Hopefully we'll be 
be up and running very soon. But I want to let folks know that that's going to be available, and we really want to get those out there to folks who may be facing these issues. So now, I do want to mention we have several folks who have joined us so far. Anya and Serena and Blake have joined us on Facebook. Also, though, while I'm working on getting Dwight connected here, I do want to mention the Military Law Task Force is a non-governmental organization. We're actually affiliated with the National Lawyers Guild. We are a non-governmental, non-profit organization. Um, which is important, meaning that we are not in, in cahoots with the imperial agenda. We are taking it from a very different perspective. So I do want to mention that. There you are. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> I don't know if it was needed, but just in case. <laughs> fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And sorry for the technical hiccups. We will get better over time. Uh, I will mention we'll probably go, we're obviously going to go a little bit over time today because of our technical hiccups. So I uh, hope everyone can stay tuned who can. But um, I was when introduced Dwight. Uh, I've known him for um, oh, a few years now. Got to know him through the adults, the adult, uh, adult um, Aspies group here in the central Oklahoma area. But also got to know him because of, he's also a member of the clergy. And so he and I've had a lot of conversations over the years about what it means to be someone on the autism spectrum and to be involved in religious work. And there's a lot of folks out there that think that those concepts are completely contradictory, that how could you possibly do religious work if you lack empathy? And then the idea of, is it really true that autistic people lack empathy and quite a few other misconceptions out there? So we've had a lot of good conversations about this. And so it would be good today to, as this, for the Objector Church, we're exploring issues of diversity and what spirituality looks like in non-traditional contexts. We wanted to make some space for that conversation. So, Dwight, could you want to introduce yourself, tell us a little about yourself, and we'll get the conversation going. Sure. So, uh, my name is Dwight Welch. I'm a campus minister at uh, Montana State University in Billings. Um, and uh, representing seven denominations and, and working with college students. And yeah, I was in Norman, Oklahoma. We did actually just start a autism group at MSU Billings. Mm -hmm. And I think it may be the only college group in a five state region, so. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. How's the response been to it so far? Uh, pretty overwhelming, pretty overwhelming. Uh, we've discovered there's like, uh, the. <laughs> We have a number of LGBT members, and I'm connected with that organization as well, who come to the autism meetings. We also have a technical college called City College, which is kind of a part of the same university system. And because of their schedules, it's harder to kind of bring them in. Uh, they were a part of the initial founding of the group, but I, I'm kind of trying to figure out how to keep them as involved as well. So. We're looking at having maybe meetings over at the city college and then on the main campus um, this, this spring and see if that might do it. But yeah, we've had about a dozen folks per meeting, so. Oh, that's fantastic, fantastic. Are these mostly students? Or are they faculty members, are they people in the community? Uh, they are students, they're oh. all students, yeah. Fantastic. By the way, I want to welcome Karen just joined us on the Facebook Live. And um, if any of you have questions, comments, feel free to make them either on Facebook Live or on Zoom. We'll be jumping back and forth as comments come in. Um, I, I mentioned the autism part because um, it had something I'd never heard of. I guess I had kind of heard of Asperger's in the 90s. And I wasn't really aware of uh, but the term so much. I think it was when I was in, I was in clinical pastoral education, CPE. Uh, where you work in a hospital or in a kind of crisis center context um, and uh, and working with those folks as we were we a lot of CPE is measuring your own responses to various situations and that's where the word autism was first or Asperger's was first raised so I Read up everything I could on the subject. <laughs> I needed a research topic for myself, mm -hmm. and became self-diagnosed. And then, when I was in seminary, there was an Indianapolis uh, adults on the spectrum, and just meeting other folks, it was like, oh, ching, you know, this is it. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I have I have found my tribe. And then um, um, there was a group in Kansas, but it was really for folks who lived in kind of more group home situations or who were not independent. And the group was really designed to create social activities for them. But coming down to Oklahoma, um, everybody has their own challenges on the spectrum. Um, and even though the word high functioning is not, is a, a charged uh, term, mm -hmm. a specific set of challenges that for folks who are in the workforce or, um, or in school, like the college students and MSU Billings that are kind of distinct to them. It's not that one is higher versus lower, it's just everybody has their own kind of distinct gifts and challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just uh, finding the context and the groups that can help with that makes, I think makes a difference. And I think that's the case for religious leaders, you know, that there's a distinct set of challenges being a religious leader um, and gifts uh, that folks on the spectrum can bring. And so, it would be the same kind of sorting. How do we get, <laughs> where do you get conversation for folks who are either Sunday school teachers or, uh, you know, music leaders or pastors, clergy, chaplains? Um, it's, a, it's a distinct calling and, and to bring in folks on the spectrum will, will bring a set of challenges, so. Mm -hmm. So I think for some of our viewers, some of them are gonna be familiar with the autism spectrum, others are not. And I think for those who may be familiar with it, they may only be aware of it from the disability model. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the idea of that maybe being an oversimplification of things. And maybe I really like the definition given that autism is a complex bundle of enhanced strengths and disabilities. And that in it, and it also plays out differently for different people, but that they're it isn't all just disability. There's strengths as well. It's, it's really more of an issue of neurological difference than it is about simply, I don't know, what, what would you say about that? Yeah, there's a, a wonderful term, neurological diversity or neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. If you Google that, you'll get all sorts of really good articles on this particular subject. Um, yeah, uh, so it, it could be both the DSM and the DS, sorry, DSM-4, DSM-5 have different kind of some overlapping criteria, but it's, whether it's called Asperger's or autism, it's usually kind of stayed the same. Um, so you take it as something, one of the lists in the criteria is uh, a focus subjects, uh, focus interests. Well, that can be a disadvantage, you know? I mean, I know that when I was a kid, I had some pretty obscure interests, and I could talk about it all day, and this, made me socially, you know, uh, not adept. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Usually how people identify folks on the spectrum is they're not socially adept. Whereas if you think of also the advantages if, to imagine what it means to be focused on a particular subject, to, to not be distracted and to be able to really go deep. Mm -hmm. The surface level knowledge, uh, I don't think there's ever such thing as an Aspie who's a jack of all trades. <laughs> they, are, uh, they are, in fact, a master. Um, and that's a huge strength. And it'd be a huge strength. But for me, that was in theology, where I just read up as much as I could on the subject. Mm -hmm. And I found it helped me in the different ministry contexts. I saw a video recently that's gone viral of a six year old boy who knew everything that was going on with airplanes. Mm -hmm. and all the mechanical kind of features of that. Um, and, you know, if he becomes a pilot, that would not, you know, surprise me in the future. So those how the weak, what could be a social limitation could be a gift. Um, or, it or if it's a weakness, it depends on the social context. When I was a kid, I couldn't stop talking about Norway or the Beatles. Or, you know, those were two examples of special interest. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, by the time you become an adult, you'll discover there are folks who are very interested in the Beatles. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and all of a sudden, what was a, a limitation has now become a social connector. It has allowed you more, more easily to connect with a certain group of folks. One thing I think uh, you and I have in common, besides being on the spectrum, is we both grew up in somewhat rural settings. 
And I think that that's sometimes a challenge for people on the spectrum because there's just a limited number of people you can interact with. And so if your interests are different than others, it's hard to find your, the people that you have commonality with. Well, if you grow up in an urban center, you grow up in a bigger school, it's a lot easier to find your niche, people that, that you're gonna fit in with. So I think, that's, I think that's often, to me, adulthood has been so much easier than childhood for that reason. It's just, as an adult, you tend to self-select your friends. You're not just stuck with the same group of people just because you happen to have birthdays within a certain age range. Yes. Well, in fact, that my husband's talked about this, that you know, he grew up in rural Pennsylvania. And if you, it, there were two things, hunting, Actually, there was just one thing, hunting. <laughs> That's all, you know, and, and, and he, he wasn't terribly interested in that. And so you can feel socially isolated. College can be a big liberation for folks on the spectrum. And, and even for me, a bit high school, you know, I mean, for instance, when I was a kid, I mean, I remember from sixth grade onwards, I've been fascinated by politics. And as a 12-year-old in rural eastern Montana, that makes you weird. Mm -hmm. But today... <laughs> It makes me prophetic. <laughs> you're a pastor and you're on the left and you're interested in politics and, and, and that just seems to be the seamless fit. Whereas when I was growing up, that was, it's what made me unusual and different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, you know, I think that's right. You, you'll, find, you'll, find your, you, you'll find your niche and you'll find folks who have those same appreciations. And like I said, I think religion can do that for some people as well. I mean, it can be kind of a, I actually experienced youth group when I was a kid in the church as a, even if I didn't socially, wasn't always adept in school, they had to take you in when it came to the youth group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Regardless, yeah. So, yeah, but adulthood is much easier that way. Mm -hmm. And the other issue is that folks, uh, the other issue is when you look at the, if you look at a DSM, in terms of the social deficits in particular. Those are sets of skills. And what happens with, is that while there are folks who are neurotypical, not on the autism spectrum, who may have picked them up from social osmosis uh, early on, uh, it tends to be the folks on the spectrum um, have to learn them in the way you learn any other subject matter, not through osmosis, but reading about it or talking to people or therapy or any uh, life experiences. But the result is folks pick up skills. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the reasons adults have an interesting issue is that a lot of times people won't even believe you if you say, if you talk about Asperger's or autism, because it's so clearly evident when you're a kid. Mm -hmm. you, you're lacking so many skills in so many areas, even if you have some gifts, you know. Uh, but by the time you become an adult, you kind of learn how to negotiate a lot. You've picked up a lot of skills. It's not always apparent. I mean, maybe there's occasions where it is, certainly. Um, but eventually, people learn how to relate to folks. And um, that doesn't mean they're still not on the spectrum. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, so that makes it easier either, yeah. One thing that's super interesting on that issue of learned social skills is that one of the theories on, for a long time, there's, there's the belief that, that boys were like, I think four times more likely to be diagnosed as girls as being on the autism spectrum. And it looks like the more research happens, that it looks like that is actually probably not, well, that may be the rate of diagnosis, but that's not the rate of incidence. It probably what happens is that because girls are socialized differently than boys in a Western culture, that girls are taught social skills and and taught certain social skills in not so healthy way. In other words, boys are allowed to be themselves and hence problematic behavior stand out more. Girls from a very early age are told to conform, conform, conform. And so many women on the autism spectrum, they are not diagnosed if they are ever diagnosed until much later in life, just because they've been socialized in a way that that the differences are not so pronounced. Um, there's been some really good books written on the subject lately. Um, oh, um, uh, there's an Australian psychologist, McFan of, uh, I think her name is Tanya Marshall. She's written several books on this, and there's some others as well. But, um, but I do think, and that's also a lot of folks who have made it to adulthood, who may not have had supports when they were younger, 
they begin to have more problems later on in life. I'd say one of the biggies is either educational challenges or vocational challenges. For me, that's where a lot of my issues came up. That in when I was younger, you had family, you had all these supports. When you started being on your own independent, as, as awesome as independence and autonomy was, it also problems with executive function. In other words, making decisions, managing time became more pronounced. And for me, that's where a lot of my issues started to become more of an issue um, was in adulthood. And I think, I think a lot of folks on the spectrum, some of those things may not come out till later, but it's where the good thing is, I think that there's workarounds, there's ways to, and also since it's a matter of just finding out what's the best fit for you. For me, I learned self-employment is a great thing. Uh, working with others, I'm not, I don't always work well with others, <laughs> you know? That's an interesting point because, um, I kind of like had this intuitive sense that there's certain jobs I could do and not do um, without having a name for it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I discovered I liked motel work uh, because most of it was self-directed. There was nobody kind of standing over you barking orders. You know, you made the determinations of what needed to be done. Um, but I will say, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I did have issues all through childhood. In fact, I, mean, I saw many counselors, <laughs> took many psychological tests to figure out what was wrong. Um, they came up with ADHD because that was in the 80s and that's the term you came up with. But um, but adulthood, yeah, brought up the challenges of the workplace. In particular, um, yeah, finding the right niche. And also, um, I think for me, it's been underemployment, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I've always had a job. I've always had to financially take care of myself, <laughs> you know, regardless. Uh, but um, I, I think that it's a, I mean, I, it's a, it's amazing when you look at kind of the wages and you know, the part-time work, uh, there's some really, really gifted folks on the autism spectrum that are got, not getting the salaries or the kind of positions given their education. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it is, a, we know about unemployed folks on the spectrum, but I have a feeling that if you walk into a Barnes and Noble, you know, mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of folks on the spectrum with college degrees and maybe even advanced degrees and they're, they're getting less than $10 an hour. Yeah. That's a struggle. Um, and maybe there's a lot of challenges to the workplace in terms of socialization, job interviews, workplace relations, or even being able to stand out in a way that your work gets not noticed. And that was the thing with the Oklahoma City Group, again, because it was targeted to a certain group of folks on the spectrum. Um, we could talk about that. Do you out yourself at the workplace? Do you, <laughs> what kind of workarounds do you, can you work on? What workarounds can an employer do to help? Um, discrimination on the job is a real factor. Um, and like I said, there's a weird, like, I think some of it is just, it sounds, some of it is low self-esteem. I know that sounds weird, but I think there's a lot of folks that, don't always have the confidence in their own knowledge and their own skill base. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I was told, well, you just can't do that. And that's easy to believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suspect some folks are held back because they internalize all the things they've been told they can't do. You know, and I've wondered about that for even clergy. You know, I think there are more clergy, obviously, out there. Than, than are, you know, public about it. <laughs> so oh, absolutely. I, but I've, I mean, I've talked to folks who are like, I want to consider seminary, I want to consider ministry, but I mean, people have just said, oh, you can't, you just can't do that because people on the spectrum don't do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, kind of related to this topic, I wanted for us to visit, a, I, I wanted to ask you about this, a phenomenon that I've seen in the autism community. And this is, um, I'm sure that there are exceptions to this, this is a gross generalization, but from my perspective, it seems like for folks in the autism community, I see no one is indifferent about things, including religion. And so I think there's a much higher percentage of atheists on the spectrum, and I think there's a higher percentage of 
really intensely focused religious people on the spectrum. I don't think there's as many indifferent people on the spectrum as there are in the rest of population. Do you think that's, is that just, am I, what do you think about that, that um, judgment? Well, I mean, I, okay, so the stats bear it out in spe specifically in terms of atheism and agnosticism. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to do surveys, <laughs> right? If these are surveys done on places like Wrong Planet, which is uh, one of the largest gatherings of folks on the spectrum on one social you know, platform. Um, and it was about 54% were atheists and another, you know, an agnostic, uh, by far the biggest group. The interesting part is the second largest group were not, fundamentalists were way, way off the radar. They exist, right? But to be sure, I've run into them. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm not some autistic Christian groups, and I've run into it. But they're, they're not near as common. The second largest group are folks who are putting it together in their own way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's not the case that autistic folks need rules. If the autistic need folks need rules and, 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 and forms a structure that makes sense to them. Mm -hmm. so it's not just any rule will do. It's got to be the ones that they would actually want to sign on to. And so putting religion, religious ideas into your own kind of framework that makes sense to you is, our, is, is probably about 30 some percent. And then there's another like, like 20% that would probably fit into the traditionally orthodox, I mean, mm -hmm. your, your, you know, Methodist or Baptist. Um, but atheism agnosticism is by far the largest category. Um, I do run into religious indifferentism, at least among some of the college students that I've been working with. Mm -hmm. It's more like they kind of, they have their own interests and religion just isn't a part of that. You know? Okay. Um, that makes sense. You know, you know but um, they, it's almost like, Oh, I guess it's some other people's interests or hobby. I'm not sure why they have it, but <laughs> <laughs> there are some theories of why that's the case. Of why there's so much atheism and agnosticism. It was, and it was interesting because in Oklahoma, our group defied that. I mean, we were all, well, not defied it. We were probably about 50% religious and 50% not but uh, so, when, so one theory is um, that, that when people talk about God they, they envision a, a personal being beyond space and time who they, is a person has intentions towards us and you know we can talk to this person and you know prayer does that and you can imagine what God is you know you could pray to God and imagine God's responses but the theory of mind is that you can imagine intention, and 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 in in scientific journals, religion is seen as the attempt to see intention in in a lot of things, right? Like I got mm -hmm. that parking spot because God wanted me to have that parking spot. It wasn't random, <laughs> <right? laughs> and um, or why did this happen to me, God? You know, I feel uh, um, as if God was trying to have you fail a test or you know get sick or or be struck with illness, but but the folks on the spectrum tend to not assume intentionality, not mm -hmm. look for agency, and therefore it's hard to conceive of God in the way that mm -hmm. most Orthodox religious people do. Uh, there, there's this divine person that you can talk to. It's it's just outside of the experience of, of folks mm -hmm. on the spectrum. So religion becomes very uh, odd in that respect. Um, I suspect there's something to it, and I will say that um, I, you know, in, in in some Pentecostal and evangelical circles where you're supposed to have a warm, fuzzy feeling about God, I do you, you do feel like Mr. Spock going, "What is this strange thing that you're supposed to?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I but but theology made sense to me. You know, the conceptual ideas made sense to me, and religious community made sense. Now, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, that's the second reason that folks tend to shy away is it, it depends on the kind of religious experiences you've had. I had good communities that were very supportive of me as a weird, socially awkward kid. A lot of churches, um, and this isn't left versus right, this could be that you could be Presbyterian or Southern Baptist or whatever, 
but there are some churches that don't deal with social difference very well. Mm -hmm. Expect everybody to behave in a certain way, um, and when a kid cannot, or an adult cannot, um, they get socially ostracized. And so, people, I've run into some folks on the spectrum who are just very angry about church. They experienced churches didn't make sense. The social rules, it wasn't clear. Um, they were always not fitting in, and they were like, yeah, I just don't want to do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So those are the two. But interesting enough, like I said, the theories that, that, that at folks on the spectrum would really love fundamentalism because fundamentalism has clear rules that tell you how the world is and what works. Surprisingly, the results seem to be that's not the case. Well, I think the problem with religious fundamentalism is that it requires – a turning off of the mind because it's, it's intellectually inconsistent to me and i don't think i'm alone in saying that i think that if you literally think everything in the bible is literally true you're gonna go nuts if you i mean if you really take that and i think i think uh, aspies we tend to take things to their logical conclusions and so uh, to me that's the problem with the the and there's a part of me i spent some time in more fundamentalist directions there's parts of me that still yearn for that kind of certainty but you can't go backwards you can't dig that up and it still makes sense because you you know you can see the the man behind the curtain you know <laughs> you can see the inconsistencies yeah no i think that's right i think and and, and i think like i said people like i said having a coherent system yes we we, everybody wants that, and certainly folks on the spectrum does, but it, it would have to be in a way that makes sense to the person. Mm-hmm. It can't be just an authority figure telling you, this is the way it is, deal with it. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to work. Now, I would say, no. too, I think the fair number of people on the spectrum, those who are more religiously bent, tend to be, religion is their, their obsessive interest or their special interest. Yeah. And I think my wife and I definitely fall into that category, and I've known other people um, one of the folks I can think of back in the, the Norman group, a friend, mutual friend of ours, he definitely fits in that category. And I think of other yeah. people that just are so intense, but, but they, even then, their interest in religion is from their perspective. And so what they find interesting may be not what other people find interesting. It's, it's a very personal, um, personal journey into it that it, it may not and that's why you know i think there's a lot of religiously interested people when they get to seminary i mean one of my first i love seminary in some ways but my frustration was often having to spend so much time studying subjects i found uninteresting that there was stuff i was fascinated but there's other stuff that's just like what is the point of this and if i couldn't see the point of it i just didn't care even if i knew yeah. a grade depended on it it was so hard for me to to really invest in. And, and I had the same thing in law school. I was so frustrated by the end of law school that I had decent grades, but I just hated spending so much time studying subjects that I, about half of the law school curriculum to me seemed and still seems relatively pointless and useless, but you got to do it because it's required classes. Yeah, I, I, I've certainly had that. I've had that in religion because religion definitely has been a special interest for me. Um, but it's been certain subjects, you know, philosophy of religion, theology or philosophic theology other areas i'm not so well versed on <laughs> mm-hmm. um i hate to say biblical studies but I'm, I'm not the best at it but and i and i i can catch that pattern in myself when i was a kid i was an mm-hmm. eight student uh by the way most folks on the spectrum are of average intelligence just as a fyi mm-hmm. there's geniuses and there's you folks with intellectual disabilities, but it's pretty much the same as the neurotypical, you know, um, population. The, the difference is that for folks who are more in the middle, like myself, when I could get very specialized, developed knowledge in certain areas because I loved it, and I could mm-hmm. really impress teachers and the adults around me. But there are other areas in school I really struggled with from elementary school onwards, if it was an area that I wasn't interested in. Mm-hmm. So my grade tended to be, wow, you got a lot of A's in those history classes, those social studies and, and math. That's not fit the stereotype, but math would be like I was fighting to you know, keep my head above water. Mm-hmm. So, sometimes people, <laughs> so sometimes people are like, 
uh, oh, you can't be autistic because you're not a genius and all autistic people are Einstein or you can't be autistic because you don't have, you know, an intellectual disability. You know, you seem to do fine in school. So obviously you must be, no, no, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of, anyway, so yeah, it just depends on interests um, and ways to plug that in. Absolutely. And there are kids, I mean, and sometimes it's weird to me because I mean, I'll meet friends who are autistic too, you know, and I had a friend who could not pass a class to save his life, but he knew the entire Dungeons and Dragons systems and all the hundreds of gods and the different planes of knowledge and the different, you know, the entire system. He, he loved role playing, right? He couldn't be bothered with his history books. <laughs> so his grades looked bad, but it wasn't because he wasn't smart. He was directing it to Dungeons and Dragons and the kind of the mythological world that that was. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So I kind of I feel lucky I got interested in things that socially. <laughs> A little more acceptable. Society, yeah, the society recognizes as important, you know, but. Mm -hmm. Well, time-wise, we are getting close to the end. We did say we'd run a little bit late, but I don't want to run too late. But I wanted to mention real quick for anyone who is watching that we do love comments, questions. If you have one, post them on either Zoom or in Facebook Live. For folks after, though, this broadcast who are watching it in recorded format, we'll have it very soon up on Facebook and some other platforms. Um, Dwight and I, I think we'll... I uh, was going to ask you, Dwight, if you could kind of monitor those discussions afterwards, too. We might have some more discussions. We'll watch after the fact. Um, I wanted maybe to close with, for the ending up our time a little bit, well, a couple things. One, one thing I want to mention real fast, again, just a reminder, this is the weekly webcast of the Objector Church. And if you want to keep following us, look for us on social media, websites, objector.church. Next week, we will have... Um, we have our guest is going to be Anya De Marie, and she's going to, we're going to be talking about um, the role of dance, physical movements, and spirituality, particularly from the perspective of the flamenca tradition. So, I encourage you to tune in next week. Really excited about that. Anya is one of our ministers with the Objective Church. We'll be talking with her live from Oakland, California. So, I encourage you to tune in next week. We're very excited about that. But Dwight, to kind of finish our time, I was wondering if you could maybe. Maybe we're closing, and maybe talk a little bit about how. Um, um, well, maybe maybe I'm thinking about the, about the role of neurodiversity in a broader sense, and I've I'm really compelled by the idea. I've, I've heard this not just from a lot of sources, but especially from um, John Elder Roberson, who's an author, phenomenal author, by the way. If you have a chance to read him his books, they're excellent. But he argues that there's a small percentage of people that diagnostically fit in the autism spectrum. You have a much larger group that shares some of the criteria, but not all of them. And then you have all the rest of humanity. And his argument is, is that by the good thing about having a label is it does help people to have access to services, have access to understanding themselves. The negative is, is that it sometimes obscures the fact that many of the traits that we label as being autism or in some other neurological difference really are just differences within the range of normal humanity. Um, and so I was wondering what can the neurodiversity idea, what can we do with that in other contexts? And I'm thinking about in, in, the, in the religious context and the activist context, other places. How could it inform us? How could it help us to see things differently and act differently? Um, that's, uh, I, you know, I actually think of uh, the neurodiversity movement as very similar to the LGBT. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's a kind of like LGBT was a way of talking about how sexuality and gender is actually that's it's a spectrum itself. You know, yes, yes, um, and and perfectly normal. And 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 um, the question was how do we kind of relate to it? And I think I think neurodiversity a, a lot of uh, like right now uh, some of the discussion has been like the. Um, representations of neurodiversity on television and media, but a lot of the campaigns and discussions and even organizations, you know, don't just talk about autistic folks, invite autistic folks to, you know, invite them into the conversation. Don't, <laughs> um, 
a lot of the things that you saw in the LGBT movement, you're starting to see in autism and, and neurodiversity kind of advocacy. And there's some good groups doing that. Um, they're uh, working for uh, the Autism Self-Advocacy Network. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to mention, because I do think religion in some ways is one of the last frontiers, even though we, we still have to, we've got a long way to go um, to inclusion. Um, one is I, I started a group called Neurodiverse Religious Workers. Um, and it's on Facebook. And my hope has been that there are pastors. Uh, there are, like I said, religious education professionals. There are uh, active lay leaders in religious congregations who um, may not realize that there are, in fact, other folks. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and who are balancing ideas of what do you do when it comes to pastoral visitations and hospital visits and religious leadership and what does that look like? Um, because if we can talk about it, share ideas, support each other, um, I think, A, we might come up with some solutions that are uniquely our own. <laughs> you know, instead of like, why can't I do exactly what I see other people do? You know, if we kind of band together ourselves, and talk to each other we may find those workarounds that are more appropriate for us so that mm -hmm. we can be good pastors or good you know uh, good teachers <laughs> um, good uh, uh, volunteers whatever it is that we want to be able to do though um, instead of measuring ourselves by some standard that we're not because that can be really disconcerting <laughs> absolutely by the way, for that for that Facebook group, how could someone find that who's interested in it? Well, I was wondering, it is public. So if you search for neurodiverse religious workers, it is a public website um, and, uh, or Facebook group. Um, but mm -hmm. I can also send it to you if you wanted to post it on um, on, on your page. Um, and we try to, I try to find our, it's not a terribly active group. I am trying to, you know, as I find artists, Articles. There's a, a few act, really active people in it, but um, also just a way to share resources with each other and links that may prove useful. So, okay. Well, before we close, I want to ask: Is there anything that, and any website or project you'd like to share, just for our viewers to stay in touch with what you're doing, as far as your ministry there at Montana State or anywhere else? Um, well, we do have United Campus Minute or UCM at MSUB. Um, and that help, that will include our, the work that we're doing with the autism, autistic community at, at the college. Um, and and um, um, I do write a blog for Approaching Justice, and I have not been near as attentive to it as I need to be. Um, but I have written on autism and faith there as well. Um, I, you know, but I think that uh, the neurodiverse work, religious workers is a good site because I try to pull in resources from a range of authors, um, including autistic pastors and, and, and writers, um, and disability advocacy. Because I think that once you, you, you talk about neurodiversity, we're gonna, you, it's going to expand to ADHD, Tourette's. You know, it could include the, you know bipolar. I mean, there's a range of kind of conditions that if we took neurodiversity seriously, I think it'll become an ever-growing, <laughs> ever-growing mm -hmm. ever subject of the, uh, an inclusion of folks. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dwight, and I hope we get to have you on again. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And, I would uh, love to do that. <laughs> and uh, just for anyone who's watching, thank you so much for tuning in. And again, see us next week, same time. We're on Facebook Live and on Zoom. You can find out all about the meetups at objector.church slash meetup. And don't forget, today is Giving Tuesday. So if you haven't given to your favorite charity, consider us. Information how you can donate or join our church is found at objector.church. And we'll see you next week.